We want to say greetings to everyone. and Thank you all so much for being here today. Uh, my name is Brother Hawk Bolden, and as usual, uh, we're grateful to be able to come before you and uh, share with you the things that the Lord has laid on our hearts to share with you. Uh, we're going to uh, discuss something this morning. We're going to read an email that we received from a young lady, and we're going to discuss something uh, to try to help bring some balance to some scriptures uh, and something that can be confusing to people if we're not careful. All right. So uh, we'll read this email real briefly and then help you. this should help you understand where we'll be coming from. So this is from the young lady who had wrote us uh, about the child support. And my wife and I, we did a uh, couple of messages on that. And so this uh, is a response to the answer that she received from us through the messages. She says, hello, brother and sister Bolden. I just want to say praise the Lord for everything he is doing with you both and for using you both to carry on his message to people all around the world. I just want to thank you both for answering my question regarding the child support situation. I have heard clearly of what the Lord wants of me to do as a believer, and I will obey his answer. I can say that the Lord was answering me with this situation long ago. I have realized this after watching the video, but I was not sure if that was the Lord. I made two appointments to see lawyers and did not end up going for some reason. Also, I kept feeling to leave it alone and that I was taken away from truly believing that the Lord is all I need to provide for me and my son. But when, but then I would get thoughts and others in my ears saying God is okay with you taking him to court because he is not doing what he is supposed to do. I guess I was letting the feelings of, of uh, I should not do this alone because it's not right and other people's opinions get to me more than what the Lord was saying to me. Praise the Lord for his mercies. Also, I guess I was trying to make to take matters into my own hands by thinking that because a man should take care of his child, that I was going to see that he does. But it is clear that was never my place and I wasn't allowing the Lord to work and trying to do it myself. Before, I never thought there was anything wrong with taking him to court, but I kept getting a feeling that I should leave it alone. I now know that the Lord was planning that feeling in my heart to allow him to provide for me and to avoid taking matters into my own hands the wrong way. I never considered the courts the way you explained because I thought the courts was something put in place by God, like the laws of the land. But of course, not all laws are put in place by God. Can you shed more light on which laws are intended by God to stay put and followed by believers and which are misunderstood to help but are not the Lord's way? Again, I have been truly blessed by this message and cried my eyes out to God from hearing this. So praise the Lord. My heart is open to receiving his word and change for, to change for the better. I pray the Lord continues to bless your ministries and family. Thank you. So uh, the part we want to focus on in this, in this uh, email is what she's saying here. I never considered the courts the way you explained because I thought the courts was something put in place by God, like the laws of the land. But of course, not all laws are put in place by God. Can you shed more light on which laws are intended by God to stay put and followed by believers and which are misunderstood to help but are not the Lord's way? Okay, so we can look at it. Look at this both two ways. Uh, there are several laws, in, especially in America, in the United States, that are laws uh, that allow people to do certain things and allow people to be a certain way, but are really uh, against God's word. So there are permissible laws. And then there are laws that go against what God says as far as not allowing you to not necessarily allowing, but actually go against uh, what God permits. So there are laws that um, permit certain things that God does not permit. And then there are laws that God permits that goes against uh, what the state or the, the government uh, won't permit. 
And so one of those things, of course, on the other side is abortion. We know that God is against murder. God is against killing us, killing unborn babies and children. And so that's one of the things that the nation permits that God does not permit. Also, homosexuality or sodomy. Uh, uh, up until recently, believe it or not, you can check it. There are some states where sodomy was against the law. You know, now those were laws, but they were not enforced. And they were old laws that maybe uh, lawmakers never went back and revised and stuff like that, you know, that God, that God never permitted. So God is against sodomy. He's against bestiality. And I'm just reading the other day that in Canada, they're allowing some form of it. And, and you, you know, and then it's got some, I was reading a few months ago, it's got some woman overseas somewhere trying to marry a dog or a cat or something like that. She, you know, yeah. And uh, <laughs> so it, there are a lot of things that you can, you're going to see because of the wickedness of this nation and the law, laws that have been passed to allow uh, wickedness. You're going to see a lot of, um, you're going to see a lot of these weird things come down the pike because of this allowance. You see that? And so, um, while it's true that you can't legislate righteousness, when you're going in opposite direction, you're inviting the devil in, you know, pretty much. You know, you can't pass laws to make people live for the Lord. No, you, you can't do that. But you can have, there is a such thing as decency. You see that? You don't need the Lord really to be decent, if that makes any sense. And just some things that, as you've heard me say before, that goes against nature. It's common sense that two men shouldn't be together and two women just by the our anatomy. But, you know, when people are bound and that's really what it is, they want to make room for being bound. You know, they want to make it make sure because, of course, like I said, uh, in this country, it was against the law for at one time for a man to marry another man or people of the same sex to marry one another. But now we see that, you know, of course, that has changed. And um, now... The next thing you're going to see, and you can you can you can go to the bank on this one. You're going to see, uh, I can't remember what they call it now. Three people wanting to marry one another. Like instead of two people being in covenant, it'll be three, four, five people wanting to be in covenant. You know, and uh, we know that that's, uh, in other words, it'll be a polygamy. In other words, and we know that that uh, that that's against God's word, of course. But we're going to see. All kind of things come down the pipe because of these different things that have been a, a, allowed. And so it's our job as believers uh, not to go along with it. Not, not to, and when I say don't go along with it, I don't just mean, well, I don't, you know, to say in your mind, well, I don't agree with that. And it's not me doing it. So, you know, I'm not worried about it. Uh, you ought to be praying about it. You ought to be thinking about it. You see, uh, th this society, because you live in this society, that means that it's certain things you're going to have to deal with. And it's impossible for the devil to make room and headway in a nation without God's people having their rights taken away. You see that? Now, that's automatically. Whenever the devil pushes, then that means that God's people are being pushed back. You see that? And so, of course, and to just illustrate what I mean... Uh, now you got all of these couples who are wanting to get married, uh, these gay couples that are wanting to, 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 to marry one another. They're purposely going into Christian establishments, whether they're churches or, uh, bakeries or whatever, basically trying to force believers, those that are taking a stand against what they're doing, trying to force them to participate, whether it's performing the ceremony or baking the cake or, you know, providing uh, other services, whatever the case may be. And so uh, I was, uh, I think it was a couple of years ago, it was a couple that owned a bakery up north somewhere that ended up getting shut down, you know, because they refused to bake a cake for and make a wedding cake for a homosexual couple. And of course, you know, as well as I do, I'm sure they weren't the only bakery in town or in the state, you know, but, you know, it, it's the devil's way of coming against God. You see, it's the devil's way of doing that. It, it's one thing for you to want to get married and, and live in sin yourself, but then you want other people to participate and take part in that, and most believers know better than that. 
And so th this is what we're talking about. You have to, as a believer, be willing to stand up for what God says. So this is one side of it. The other side of it is that there are some laws that that God tells some things that God tell us to do that the government don't want us doing. Uh, one is praying in school. You know, we're supposed to pray. And uh, in the public schools, the government don't want you praying in public schools. They don't want you reading your Bible in the public schools. On your own time, I should say that, you know. And uh, also, uh, I, I was reading a few years ago about this man who was having church in his home. And so I think in Arizona, somewhere out west, and um, they didn't want him assembling together in his home. They were trying to force him to uh, stop assembling, you know. And, of course, uh, we know that that's against God's word. The Bible tells us to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. We read all through the, through the Gospels and through the epistles and even in the book of Acts where people gather together in the homes of people to hear the word of God. And, of course, my thing about that is if people can get together and every week and watch football and watch sporting events or just assemble the gossip and doing all, all these other things. What, what, you know, and, and without being checked by some homeowners association or by some city councilman, then what is wrong with people gathering together for the purpose of, of talking about the word of God, you see? And so pretty soon it will get down to that where people are going to have to sneak you know, and, and I'm talking about in America. Now, it's already going on in some places, but pretty soon that will become very common where people that don't want to be in, in churches, buildings, I guess you could put it, because of a lot of the stuff that goes on in some of them. Uh, and they choose to gather with small groups and, you know, and, and these groups are choosing not to necessarily buy a building dedicated for, you know, worship or whatever they call it. Uh, and they just choose to gather in their home because they're a small group, then, you know, pretty soon it'll be against the law, you know, and I'm sure there are some places like what I mentioned before who have it, you know, in their law that groups can't gather together for the purpose of serving the Lord and things like that. And then, of course, there are some cities who want you to... Um, there are some cities that want you to get per permits for the purpose of preaching in open air. And of course, in other words, it's red tape added there. And then I'm sure that there are some who don't want you preaching in open air at all, you know, that don't want you doing that at all. There are some cities who want you to have a permit to gather for a, a group of people to gather in public, just standing out somewhere on, in the park or whatever, you know, to discuss the word. But we see in the Bible where uh, uh, the ministers in the Bible, they were doing what we call open air preaching. In fact, there was more preaching in the open air. In other words, not in a building than there was inside the building. You see that? And so it's like this government, it, it, you, you know that it's really ran by Satan. Now, you know that, you know, you, if, you have to be blind not to see that. You see, now, if you don't see it, then I'd say you probably need to get saved and ask the Lord to open your eyes because you don't have to be uh, mature in the Lord to see that this government goes against God. And so when you know that a government is set up the way that this one is set up, where the people have rulers or think they have really, you know, and that, that's a whole nother story there. But where the people have a vote then and you have a government where you have more unrighteous people than righteous and even people in the church. Uh, you know, and I say people in the church, I'm not talking about church people. I'm talking about people in the church, which is the difference. You have people in the church that go along with sin. That what kind of, what kind of laws do you think you're going to have when you have more unrighteous people having a vote than you have righteous people? And most righteous people really aren't concerned about voting and all of that because ultimately you understand God's will is going to be done even if that means allowing Satan to have his way in a particular country for judgment to come, you see. So that's that's a whole nother teaching in it in and of itself. And so when you have a government like this one, it, it really what it does, it goes back to the first church, to the first century church, the church that was born 
uh, from Christ's time. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to go to the uh, fifth chapter of the book of Acts. And we're going to start reading at verse 17. says, Then the high priest rose up, and all that they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation, and laid their hands on the apostles, and put them in the common prison. But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors, and brought them forth, and said, Go stand, and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning, and taught. But the high priest came, and they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the people of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keeper standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto they this would grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that you should not teach in this name and behold ye fill Jerusalem ye have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us so you see there that you're talking about religious people now this these the Sadducees the, the that sect and the the uh, council and all of those people you're talking about the marriage between the church and the state the religious people now in the in in this day in the bible days in in during this time after jesus christ ascended he began to multiply in the church the people began to multiply and they began to these believers these christians began to be persecuted and it seemed like and you think about it paul's ministry paul the first time we read about him what is he doing helping to persecute the church he's getting letters you know, documents that gives him a right to go and arrest Christians and to persecute them, throwing men and women in jail who are just just being believers. So th this whole time, all of these Christians are being persecuted. They're being killed. Uh, and and they, they think, because I want you to think about something. Jesus Christ, when he left here, uh, at the time that he left, it had about 120 disciples. Everybody else had just kind of went on about their business. And so the, what, what the establishment thought, which was not only the Roman government, but those Jews who were religious, who called themselves following God, what they thought was, we can just kill them off. It's not that many of them. It's more of, and we have the backing of Rome now. And so they thought we can just kill them off. Now, let me tell you what Rome did. Rome was a pagan nation. And they had several gods in their uh, worship system. And, and so since Rome was so big, because basically Rome covered the whole continent of Europe, they knew that if they thought, well, if we want to remain strong, then we have to unify. And if we unify, that means we have to allow all of these religions in here. We have to allow them, which is why you see these uh, these Greek gods and all these other gods set up there. And the children of Israel, the Jews, the religious Jews, they see all of this and they're just going along with it. They're in bed. Think about it. The Jews were in bed with Rome to crucify Jesus Christ. They couldn't, they couldn't convict, nor could they kill a man without Rome's permission because they were under Roman rule. And so for them to even persecute Jesus Christ and his followers, they had to first of all be in bed with Rome. So after Jesus Christ died, they thought if we kill him, then his followers will scatter. We won't have to worry about them anymore. 
except by doing that, of course, we know what happened. They really gave birth to a bunch of other followers. And when Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, what took place? They began to multiply, the believers. They, thousands of them were being added at a time. Now, they weren't, a lot of them, the, 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 those that were in power, they weren't present for these meetings, a lot of them. And so they didn't know how much it was multiplying. They just thought, well, it's just a few believers. We can kill them off and that'll be it. And pretty soon they, you know, and, and they would have persecution parties where they were just killing these, you know, people. And, and you, you can read some historians say that they, it would just had a man just standing there, just cutting their heads off, just all day and night. Next, you know, they'd bring the next person up and cut their head off next. And the only reason why they would stop is because the one that was doing that was getting tired. So they thought we can kill them off and, and they thought by killing them that it would discourage them. Now, you can, you can read here and let's read verse 29. It says, then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. You see that? And so if, if you keep reading there, you'll see that as these apostles were being whipped, as they were being persecuted, it encouraged them because the Bible said they thought it an honor to be persecuted for Christ's sake. And so this killing of Christians had the opposite effect of what the government wanted it to have. They thought if we kill them off, sure enough, they'll back down. At least they'll go on the ground somewhere and won't be trying to convert anybody else. They won't be out preaching in public. But look at what happened early on in this chapter. They were arrested, put in prison, and then the angel of the Lord came and took them out and told them, go and preach in, 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 the, in, the, in the place there. You see that? And, and go stand in the temple, in other words, and preach to the people. Not go underground, not just wait a little while for things to cool down. I'm breaking you out of jail. You've been put in there for preaching. I'm breaking you out to tell you to go preach in the open again. So we see there how the Lord worked there. You see that? We see how he He worked there, and that's exactly what took place. So that that is our key verse, verse 29. We ought to obey God rather than men. So what happened was after they saw that the Christians kept multiplying uh, and of course the Jews were still under Roman rule, somewhere around 300 AD, there was an emperor that rose up named Constantine and he knew that Christianity was flourishing, flourishing very much so. And his whole thing was, I want the Roman Empire to remain one. I don't want it to. It was a strong empire where no one could come in and take over and, and, and run it. You know, it was, they had a very strong army. Could, no nation outside of Rome would Rome. But what they were afraid of was of dissolution within. In other words, for us to remain strong like we are, then and nobody can whoop us on the outside of us then the only threat we really have is is that if there is dissension on the inside and so therefore we are we gonna gonna become a melting pot we're gonna allow all of these gods and so what they did at the council of nicaea they had a meeting with christians uh of the church and basically they got the church to incorporate a lot of the pagan rituals. So basically, at, at that council, Christianity was added into the Roman Empire and had, in fact, become the law. And with that, Christianity adopted a lot of pagan beliefs, a lot, like the Trinity. There was no Trinity before then. The people understood there is one God. They understood Jesus Christ was God. But after that, Christians adopted this idea of a trinity, there being three gods. Now, that's pagan all day long. I don't care how you try to shake that up and cook it. It's, that's paganism all day long. They adopted with that Christmas, the celebration of that, which was really a, a worship of a sun god, not the son of God, but of the sun god himself, Nimrod. They adopted Easter, what Christians call Easter, but which, which is really is the fertility God, 
Estar or Ashtaroth. You can read about that in the Bible as well. They adopted all of that. So there you saw the marriage of the church and the state or the church and the government for the purpose of peace. Now, on, on their minds. Now, really, the devil, he just wanted to infiltrate the church and to corrupt it. The devil's mindset was, since I can't stop the church from growing, I can corrupt it. And so with that, God is calling out believers and he's setting up ministers that is going to preach the truth that's not going to go along with the, the status quo. What you see in a lot of these churches today are churches that have gone along with this marriage between the church and the state. And to prove it, God's word let us know that we shouldn't be around fornicators, that we shouldn't allow them in our fellowship. You can read that in the fifth chapter of 1 Corinthians, that we should have no fellowship with darkness. But instead, these churches have adopted the mindset and have compromised for the sake of love. How are we going to win them over if we don't preach to them, if we don't allow them to come and sit in the congregation? Now, the whole time, the church mindset is we can win them over if they come and hear the word. The only problem is they're not trying. They're not trying to be won over. You've allowed the devil to infiltrate your, your church and he's corrupting other people. So if I'm sitting on side of a homosexual who is not, not don't get me wrong, let them come to church, but preach to them and, and preach against what they're doing. And if they don't repent for it and they don't want to change, then that's your clue that they don't want to follow the same God that you're following. So then they need to be put out. But what we do, a lot of churches do, is allow them to come and they think, well, we can win them over. They can just hear the word and eventually their lives will change. When in reality, what happens is you got people sitting on side of these homosexuals, on side of people that's living in sin, whether they're adulterers or whatever it is they're doing, and knowing that they're doing it. And because of that, they're sitting together, then compromise enter into other people. It might not be the same thing that this one is doing, but compromise is there. You see that? And that's where the problem is. So the Bible says we are to obey God rather than men. Why? Because men want it all to be in one big pot. Men want everybody to just get along and hold hands. Jesus Christ, when he walked his earth, he said, think not that I am come to bring peace, but I come to send a sword. Husband and, and between father and sons and mothers and daughters in other words i come to divide households what does he mean i stand for righteousness and everybody that stand for righteousness is going to stand with me and people that stand for anything else they're going to be on the other side of it and sometimes that's going to happen even in the homes so the bible tells us that we ought to obey god rather than men i don't care what somebody's law say if god tell me to do something then that's just the law that's going to get broken and that's just really all it is to it. And my prayer is that you will fear God more than you fear the consequences of disobeying somebody's law. Amen. All right. We want to say thank you all for joining us today. We pray that something was said that have been a blessing to you. And we pray that you will continue to listen in to this broadcast. Have a blessed day.